well. All right, so, but before we turn to that, to these multiple fronts, uh, which, which, we, which I will bring to an end uh, on Wednesdays, uh, I want to continue my discussion of World War I. So when I've been talking to you about World War I, uh, the last note on which I had uh, concluded my lecture was I had been talking to you about the enormous human toll to the casualties. You might remember this, and you recall that what I mentioned that India, for example, as an illustration, is is not mentioned uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the count here. Uh, whoever compiled that didn't really think of doing that, but uh, it was it was a war in which colonial empires were deeply, of course, implicated, uh, and a point I've made repeatedly that one has to really think about this as a European war, uh, as in some ways an extension of colonial wars as well. All right? However, uh, having uh, mentioned that, I want to turn to some of the elements of the war. I want to look at one element very briefly, uh, which is this notion of sacrifice, uh, sacri obedience unto death. Because of course, this is the very idea of being in a in a military, right? One of the things that a military demands from everyone, it, it exacts your complete obedience. Uh, that's one institution which will brook no disloyalty whatsoever. Uh, the other institution is uh, the White House under Donald Trump now. It won't brook any disloyalty either, uh, as we know. But the military is certainly that institution. It will not brook any disloyalty. However, the question really is, what is it that makes people, now, and we're not, we're not going to do a psychoanalysis of what it means to be in the military, what impels people to go. We know that sometimes there are socioeconomic reasons. We know that in the United States, the minorities have been disproportionately represented, and the US military, uh, one of the reasons for that is, of course, because there are fewer opportunities for them. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at it over a period of time. Uh, so forth and so on. So one can one can speak of it in that sense. One can give an analysis which would be an analysis that would tie in the military with wider strands of what's happening in society. But but of course the critical question really remains. You know, what is it that compels people to be able to offer their lives? You know, how does a country breed the idea of nationalism in its subjects? How does it breed nationalism in its subjects? Uh, this is really the question that comes in some ways to the fore in studying World War I. I mean, you can look at it geopolitically. You can look at you know, what the great powers were doing, the various arrangements that come alive at that point in time, the shifting alliances, the, the interests of each nation state. But what I think is really compelling is, particularly when you look at French warfare, you know, and you know what the nature of trench warfare was, because World War I, is really associated deeply with the phenomenon of trench warfare. You know, where you would drink, dig these trenches, and soldiers would literally live in these trenches for months, sometimes for a year or two years. So, uh, uh, and, and when you had these battles, right? if you look, for example, at the toll that, you know, I gave you the, the, the total toll, but if you look here, um, I have a slide here which gives you, so uh, comparison of casualties from major Western Front battles. So if you look at 1916, Verdun and the Somme, I mean, there, what are you talking about? The Allies, we're talking about over a million people killed in these, and these are basically trench battles, you know, all right? Uh, and on the German side, again, you're talking about something, uh, you know, at a minimum, you're talking about close to a million if you add the 355 and the 600, roughly. You know, you know, that's what we really talked about. Well, a minimum would be about 800,000, but it could go up to, as I said, a million, depending on uh, you know, how reliable the figures are. And one of the things, of course, that happened in World War I is that we don't really have an exact count. Uh, many of the bodies weren't recovered. You know, there's an institution, if you ever go to European cities, particularly European cities, and all the European cities, you'll see what is called the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So this was uh, uh, a monument to the soldier who was not recognized. In some sense, of course, I'm saying that even if you were recognized, you were always unknown, because you're simply a number. You're, an ent you're, you're not really a living entity, uh, even while you are living. Why? Because you are being sacrificed 
to some higher cause. So this fetish of blood sacrifice is, I think, one of the most uh, extraordinary and alarming things about World War I. The idea that you can you give your blood, it purifies you, it ennobles you, right? And then you're going to be recognized by the nation state. And this is, of course, th these are, of course, all the ways in which the nation state exacts its uh, uh, obedience from its subjects. And you know, I've, I've touched upon this subject in passing when I've spoken to you about such things as the national anthem. Why does every nation state have a national anthem? Because it wants to produce a certain kind of consent, a certain kind of homogeneity. The project of the nation state has an intricate relationship to the idea of producing homogeneity. So here's a quotation here from um, one person uh, who writes a letter in war, the book is called Letters in Wartime. Uh, this letter was written uh, in February 1917. And what, what does he say? These men, in the noble indignation of a great ideal, face a worse hell than the most ingenious of fanatics ever planned or plotted. Men die scorched like moths in a furnace, blown to atoms, gassed, tortured. War is not a pretty thing. I mean, you know, leaders who are trying to take countries into war, including democracies, do so partially because, as I said, the people who are being sent like sheep to slaughter are those who come from largely the working class, predominantly the working class. They don't come from the elites. And of course, it's not only a matter of class, but that is always a factor. People who are dispensable, you know. And again, other men step forward to take their places, right? So you have a wave of people who die, and then other soldiers will step into their place. And we're going to see, I, I picked this quotation very deliberately, we're going to see that the creation of armies of non-violent resistors by Mohandas Gandhi 20 years from now, 15 years from now, was predicated on the same principle. Except, of course, the principle there was not violence, rather than violence, but that you sent volunteers, armies of volunteers, they would be beaten up, then another army of volunteers. They'd be beaten up, then another one. Waves and waves. Except that here, it is slaughter. Here, it's slaughter. And the question remains that men, Look what he's saying. And again, other men step forward to take their places well knowing what will be their fate. They know that they are almost certainly going to be slaughtered. Bodies may die, but the spirit of England. Now, this is the catch. The bodies may die, but the spirit of England grows greater as each new soul speeds upon its way. Right? So here, the writer puts forward this lofty picture. Sounds you know, philosophical, it could, be a, it could be a text from one of the scriptures from one of the religions. Ah, well, the body dies, but the soul never dies. So this is, this is the consolation for these people, right? They know that they have, they have abandoned their bodies. Uh, but it's like you take off a shirt, and then you put on another shirt, right? So the body is just dispensable, but the soul is what remains. And this is going to ennoble England. And this is what you get. So here are these men, you know, right? These are, these are all men who lost their legs in the war. But they don't look sad or blooming to me necessarily. In fact, the way the picture is being, has been uh, created, the photograph, the way they are posing for it, it's like, let us display the accoutrements of war. It's like the, it's like the knight with his sword. Except that here there's no sword. Here it is the amputated limb is really the sword. That our amputated limbs show the steel that we are made of, our resolve. And with our sacrifice, we have ennobled England. Right? That was the logic. It is a ferocious, perverse <coughs> logic, but it is a logic of violence and war almost everywhere the world, particularly when wars are fueled by some kind of extreme nationalism. You know, right? Now, what all 
these countries had to do was they had to, of course, create propaganda machines as well. That's the usual word that is used in the context, propaganda. Propaganda is a very, is a word that lends itself to all kinds of interpretations, you know. Uh, we all know the meaning of the word in a very casual sense. But, but uh, more precisely, these are machines which are, these propaganda machines are machines which are intended to generate uh, more loyal subjects, more recruits, more volunteers, uh, and in all of these countries, uh, they would produce massive number of posters, right, encouraging uh, people. So one of the assignments that you had, you might recall, was I pointed your attention in the website to, uh, in the syllabus to a website where you have a whole bunch of posters, and I said, go look up some of these posters, you know. Defend your island. So this is national service. This is United Kingdom. Remember, once again, the United States only comes into the war much later on. Uh, quite reluctantly in many respects, you might say. Uh, but the, all of that can be disputed because the U.S. was on the verge of being now the great power in the world. It, you know, and World War I was certainly going to be an occasion for it to be able to demonstrate that, to flex its muscles. But, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is that we're really speaking, when we're speaking about 1914 to 1917, before the entry of the U.S. into the war, we're really speaking about uh, countries such as the United Kingdom, you know, France, uh, and so on, which are the ones, and Germany, of course, on the other side, on the central powers, which are going to produce, which are going to have this extraordinary propaganda machine. So, uh, you know, these are the kinds of posters, uh, and of course, conscription becomes uh, com compulsory uh, in, in most of these countries. You know, young men have to go and enroll uh, for the war. Uh, defend your island from the grimmest menace that ever threatened it. Right? What is a grimace menace? It is Prussianism. Prussianism, the German military machine. Right? That's the menace. That, that's, that's what a, a young man seeing this poster would understand. Right? And there was this distinct sense in England, uh, which is very important to convey to you briefly. Because you know, in England, the United Kingdom is an island, basically. Uh, it, it's an island nation, and, and I'm including here Scotland and Wales and all of that, uh, you know. Right? Uh, and the English have always seen themselves as both European and yet distinct from Europeans. The whole Brexit thing that we are going through now echoes very much this point. So this idea that we are a distinct race, a distinct civilization, we are an island people, you know, that we have a destiny that is distinct. Of course, distinct not just from, from Germany, but even France, but particularly Germany. Why? Because the notion was that Germany is inherently given to a kind of militarism that the English are not. Right? Of course, this very conveniently uh, means that you can stop thinking about the fact that Britain has an empire and that it has brutalized people in Asia and Africa for a long period of time. But the notion was that the Germans represent the true and dreadful aspect of militarism, right? So that's the grimmest menace, you know, uh, right? And I'm just going to go through these in quick succession. You can tell from 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 the posters uh, what kind of spirit is being evoked here, right? Uh, this one is is an interesting one because Belgium, which is a very small country, uh, very very small country, became a major site for the wars, and Belgium actually responded as, at least in, in Belgium's national narrative today, it's a heroic response to the onslaught by uh, the Germans. You know, a lot, of the, a lot of the battles of the Western Front, I'll show you a slide of the Western Front, were basically fought in what is called Flanders. So that's the Low Countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, Holland, uh, and the, the, this is, this is, this is a poster which commemorates those who were uh, uh, killed uh, while they were on ship by German submarines. So that's the other thing that happens in World War I, which we hadn't seen before, submarine warfare. Right? So this is, and as I said, we can kind of, we can continue the history of military technology in, in this fashion, uh, but, this, but because each war is going to introduce some element which hadn't been present uh, with respect to military technology in previous you know, battles. And these are, these are German posters now. Uh, very often what you will see here is a family in distress. So here you have a, uh, a, a mother 
with her five children. Uh, you know, she's sobbing there in the background, as you can see. Uh, there's probably a shortage of, you know, food. Uh, and once again, I, I, what I want, the reason I picked these, these ones is because uh, everywhere there is always an appeal. I mean, we just had Mother's Day yesterday, but there's always an appeal to motherhood, right? Uh, you know, you want to pull uh, the heartstrings of someone while well, you invoke the notion of the mother, right? Uh, it, and the mother is not just you know your mother, but she is the mother of all. So that that's how the nation, of course, is represented. This is, by the way, one of the things that distinguishes Germany uh, from Great Britain, the United States, uh, you know, France, India, most of the countries. In most countries, the nation is conceived as feminine, as a mother. In, in Germany, it was the fatherland, the fatherland, you know, right? But even there, you see this, right? The notion of the mother with the child. Uh, and of course, you know, this is at a time when women were, were obviously not part of the war machine in a direct sense, but they are part of the war machine uh, because they're working, they start to work in munitions factories, for example. Right? Uh, they're going to volunteer as nurses, so forth and so on. And this is going to be important both in World War I and World War II, that when you have a war of this, of this size, this, this uh, uh, enormity, uh, it brings women out into the public sphere. But typically, World War II is a classic example. In the United States, after Pearl Harbor, when the United States finally goes to war, so from uh, mid-December 1941 until the end of the war, a huge number of American women became involved in the war effort, right? They come out into the public sphere. Uh, their numbers increased dramatically because of the large number of men who were going to the front, who were going into battle. But what happens? The minute the war is over, these women are going to be forced back into domesticity. Because the implication is that, well, now we return to the sexual division of labor. Right? And, and, and in World War I, again, you have women coming into the public sphere, but then they're going to be pushed back into the domestic sphere. Uh, this phenomenon is going to be repeated here. And, and in this poster here, you see this. Uh, this is a uh, this is wheat here, the, you know, but there's a coastline figure over there you know, basically the apparition of Hagra. That's what we're really talking about here. Look how dominant that image is in all the German posters. I mean, I showed you two before, and once again you see sort of the, you know, the, the strong man uh, and then the woman uh, and the child, you know, all right? And of course it also establishes a little bit of a, not just a patriarchal, but hierarchical order in various ways. Uh, and list on which side of the window are you? So this is an appeal to the elites. Uh, so you see a man standing there, you know, finely dressed, and this is a window here. So he's sort of looking out, so to speak, from his drawing room window. Uh, and the poster is saying, well, it's time for people like you to perhaps start coming into the war too. Right? That's, that's what this poster uh, seeks, seeks to do. Uh, buy bonds, fourth liberty. So there were war bonds that were issued, both in World War I, World War II in the United Kingdom, certainly in the United States. Um, and this is this is uh, th th this itself is, by the way, an acknowledgement of the fact that under war, other kinds of social economic conditions will be created. So one of the things, of course, that happens is that you've got a large number of men going on to battle. Uh, in all of these places where you had battlefields, you had brothels too. That's that's the fact of the matter. You had brothels, uh, you know, and there would be women working in these brothels. Uh, and of course, that was the whole. The, the, there was a fear of venereal disease. So when the war is over, these men come back. Uh, there's a problem, right? And this is this is this is what this poster is really alluding to. Um, all right. So, and, and this is what I meant when I said that that uh, the involvement of women. Uh, one should not assume that they were not involved in, in these wars. This is uh, the YWCA poster. Uh, and uh, you can see the second line of defense, right? So the second line of defense is these, these women who are really working back to keep the domestic front alive, so to speak. That's, that's what it's really uh, invoking over here. 
uh, Woman's Land Army of America, so forth and so on. You there quite a few. And this is here a, uh, this is what I'm talking about here. So you, you can see here, this is the region where you had uh, these massive uh, battles that we're talking about. Uh, and you know, the, uh, uh, it's, it's too detailed to get into here, I, I'll put it up. But it basically, it, uh, it, this slide here will show you some of the major battles and will show you how the fronts were established and the troop movements. This is all over, so this is Belgium over here, right? And then you know, further down into France over here. So this is, this is the whole uh, area that you can roughly characterize as the, the Western Front. Um, however, uh, what we are more interested in, uh, to wrap up the discussion, this is, by the way, a slide of Indians in the second, in second uh, I think it was the second Rajput uh, regiment, um, uh, infantry regiment, uh, fighting in 1914, 1915. Uh, and as I said, about 56,000 uh, of Indian, uh, 56,000 Indians died over a million fought in the war. How, what are the, what we're more interested in is some of the geopolitical consequences, some of the socioeconomic consequences. Many of these we have already considered. Uh, defeat of the central powers is the most obvious one. Uh, Breakup of the Ottoman Empire, which I discussed with you before, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Imposition of the Versailles Treaty, which is going to be signed in June 1919. The Versailles Treaty is going to impose reparations. Reparations. Right? Uh, and, and I think we need to think about two things. One is reparations upon Germany. It has been argued uh, of course, retrospectively, in some ways, that by many historians, that it was the excessive amount of reparations that made Germany uh, bitter uh, about it. Uh, we know that the that following the end of the war, you don't have Nazism immediately, right? You the Weimar Republic, uh, Nazi, National Socialism is going to is going to come to the fore in the early 1930s. Uh, going to see the rise of Hitler, but that's still 15 years after the end of the war. Uh, what is very clear is that there was going to be some amount of resentment about the reparations that were imposed upon Germany. Uh, reparations is, is a key feature throughout, goes back to the time, remember the Haitian Revolution. And uh, when, uh, when we talk about, when we turn to China uh, very soon, we're going to see at the end of the boxer rebellion, once again, the imposition of reparations. So that's factor number one. Number two, something which I've alluded to in passing before. This is a good occasion to bring it up again. The notion of humiliation in history. That, that the terms that were imposed were such as to make Germany feel completely humiliated. And of course, you could say that that is the prerogative of the victor. But I think for the continuation of human civilization, it's a question that we have to put to ourselves. And that should be put in f at the front of the table, as it were, every time a war is concluded with a decisive victory for one side over another. Sometimes victories are not decisive enough. But when they are, when they are, how should a country that is a victor deal with a country that has been languished? So let's supposing that you just got this, for example, as a question, right? So saying uh, on your exam, you know, taking the il taking the illustration of what happened in Haiti, uh, what happened at the end of World War One, what happened at the end of World War Two. If you go to the end of World War II, what is it that, in a sense, is the obstacle to the conclusion of the war on the Pacific Front? Right? And I have talked about this in passing before. Again, this is a good context for bringing it up. That was the fact that the United States demanded unconditional surrender from the Japanese. And the question that came up was, well, what do we do with the emperor? What do we do with the emperor? Because unconditional means precisely this, that you, the losing side, cannot ask for any 
thing at all. And the Japanese said, we'll, we'll surrender everything. You know, we forfeit all our rights and privileges, but what? You have to give us an assurance that you are not going to put the emperor on trial. Because it was very clear that they were going to conduct war trials, as they had at Nuremberg on the, for the Japanese side. They were doing that, right? Because this is a matter of humiliation. And I think that this was an important factor here. Uh, and I think certainly the people who were drafting the Versailles Treaty were not sufficiently attentive to that. Of course, you know, after the fact, one can argue anything. Uh, I, I'm by no means trying to suggest that had there been more attentiveness to this, that we might not have had World War II or the rise of Hitler or National Socialism. I'm not making any argument of that kind. Those are all counterfactuals, right? We only have, we can only assess what we, what did transpire. But it is important to think of certain motifs which run through history, right? Uh, one of the other consequences, of course, is the demand for independence from colonies, partially spurred by their contributions to the war, India being a classic example. I've already mentioned that to you. So what was going to happen in India, there was going to be a demand that given what we have contributed to the war effort, uh, we should certainly be compensated in some ways. And compensation here didn't mean financial compensation. What it meant, obviously, was a, a demand that Indian independence be recognized or some some degree of autonomy be conferred, which would be equivalent to the kind of autonomy that had been conferred on the white colonies, such as Australia and so on. The emergence of the United States on the world stage is another consequence of World War I. Uh, one can quibble about whether World War II is whether one would have to wait until World War II really for that. Uh, the fact that the US is not excessively interventionist between 1918 and the early 1940s doesn't mean that the US was not already a world power. It chose not to exercise intervention. Uh, but I can tell you, even the Boxer Rebellion, one of the least known aspects of the Bo Boxer Rebellion, which, which, which I'll go to in just a few minutes, uh, is the fact that one of the eight countries that sent troops was the United States. And the president of the United States at that time was McKinley. And one of the most interesting things is this is the f one of the first illustrations of where an American president took the country to war without a declaration from Congress. Without a declaration from Congress, because by the US Constitution, only the Congress really has the power to wage war. But that happened during the Boxer Rebellion in 1898. 5,000 American troops were sent. So it's not that um, the United States didn't have interventionist impulses before. It did. And it could certainly have intervened a great deal more than it did in the interwar years. That's what I'm suggesting to you, that the US really does emerge as the major power. It is the end of isolationism, in a manner of speaking, for the US. Um, uh, you know, so you had the Monroe Doctrine, of course, here, which basically warned old Europe to keep its hands off uh, America, uh, because that really was another instance of uh, uh, what you might call isolationism. But the United States was going to end this, I think, in the interwar years. Right? Part, and it is, this isolationism had also stemmed out from some kind of fears of entanglement with old Europe. An awareness in the United States that Europe and its various countries, its various nation states, they had complicated histories. The United States didn't really want to get involved in it. Right? That, that is one of the things that has spurred on this isolation. I, economically speaking, by 1929, the US accounts for 35% of the global GDP. Uh, e equals B plus G plus R is Britain plus Germany plus Russia. Right? 1929. Of course, that's, and that is right. 1929 is when the depression starts. All right. um, three visions are going to sort of emerge. The strands of these have already been there, of course, before, but you could say that these three visions are now going to compete for the public space. One is the anti-colonialism, much more important, of course, in the colonies. I mean, there are some supporters, uh, a few, few supporters in Europe who are supporting uh, anti-colonial movements and national and these nationalist movements. Uh, but this is, of course, largely the colonies. You have a kind of a liberal vision uh, exemplified by people like 
uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I want to put liberal in, in uh, quotation marks because I think uh, the, the vast majority of the liberals were all complicit with colonialism, something that I've hinted at on various occasions. And then you have, of course, what's going to emerge as something that we can characterize briefly as the authoritarian, totalitarian, fascist vision, right? Uh, if one wants to dignify it with the word vision, it's not a vision, it's a, it's a view, uh, it's an ideology, right? And the League of Nations. So when we've been talking about the, the end of the Ottoman Empire and we've been talking about the mandate system, so the League of Nations was an attempt to try to introduce a new world order and organization that would, that would supersede all previous uh, organizations, uh, which had never been on, a, on that scale before anyhow, certainly not on a global scale. Right? Uh, what would the League of Nations do? It's a precursor to what is going to be the United Nations in 1945-46, uh, which still exists to the present day. And the idea was that the League of Nations would try to enforce some kind of world peace. Uh, and it had a great many other functions, and one of those, one of the, one of the, uh, the charges given to the League of Nations was the whole system of mandates. Right? This is this is a, a photograph I've shown you in a different context before. Uh, this is what this is. Uh, you know, I've been speaking about the fact that you have the rise women start to emerge into the public sphere at the end of the war. Uh, the war itself actually is a spur to this, right? So if you're looking at the socio-economic and cultural consequences of the Great War, uh, this is uh, the notion. What a word war does is it also makes it possible to think about a global society in, in a perverse kind of way. Right? Because how does one think about a global society? How does one think about the interlinkages, the exchanges, and so forth and so on? In the interwar years, you also have a spur in economic modernity, mass production and mass consumption. Uh, the whole idea of assembly line uh, 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 is launched in the early 1920s. The ambition was that you would be able to bring out a Model T every 10 seconds. Model T is the fourth, right? every 10 seconds, that was the ambition. Uh, you have such things as Taylorism. Uh, most of you probably have never heard of it, Taylorism. What is Taylorism? Uh, so there's this American guy who is really in some ways the guru of all of these management and business schools that you find today. You know? uh, and what does Frederick Taylor do? He basically says that we need to create a much more efficient machinery much more efficient way of organizing businesses, productivity, so forth and so on. So in his manual, he tells you, for example, that if you're a secretary and your boss tells you, pull out this file, in, from a file cabinet, he times everything. He says you should be able to pull out a file, for example, in 15.3 seconds. Right? Now, if you pull it out in 25 seconds, you haven't been properly trained. You have to be properly trained. And if you cannot be trained to do that, you're going to be fired, right? That's Taylorism. And this is, these are the kinds of forms of what you might call bureaucratic machinery that are going to come into place again in the interwar years. Uh, one of the consequences of the war uh, is certainly that the threshold for violence, war and violence, is raised, right? Mechanized slaughter, I've already mentioned the idea of sacrifice aerial bombing. All of these I have discussed in some detail. The emergence of multiple masses in politics. When I say multiple masses, the notion of the masses had first arisen really in the French Revolution. But here we are speaking about masses with different interests, with competing interests. You know? So it's not now simply a question of masses versus the elites. It's a question of competing masses with competing interests. Because what's happened, of course, is that the public sphere has really, really grown. That's what's happened, essentially. Yeah? And technologies of modern mass culture. Right? You have a little bit, whenever you have a respite from war, I want to suggest to you, uh, war, uh, the war machine always breeds new forms of technology. But that's military technology, basically. When you have a respite from war, it, you will have an expansion of technology in other modes. Right? And so what do you see? The birth of cinema, of course, is a little bit earlier. But this is when cinema begins to really flower in the interwar years. Right? 
the gramophone, the radio, newsreels. And typically, you know, when they used to screen films, that doesn't happen in the US any longer. It doesn't happen in, uh, in other countries where I, where I remember that used to be the norm. But that typically what used to happen was that before you, when you went to the cinema, before you saw the film uh, that you had paid your ticket for, they would show you a newsreel, a five or 10 minute newsreel. So these new re newsreels, the uh, use of the radio, increase of uh, the visual, the visual term, right? Uh, the advent of advertising. Uh, you know that Netflix uh, serial with, I don't know, 100 episodes, Mad Men or something? Uh, that's what it's really about, advertising, yeah? All right. And as I mentioned, the emergence of women in the public sphere and the undermining of traditional gender roles, but again, very provisional, right? Because the, in, in, in all of these societies where women come to the fore, uh, such as United States, Great Britain, women are going to be pushed back into the domestic sphere. All right? Now, we're done with World War I. But as I said, there are a number of multiple fronts that I want to um, open up. I want to talk about China, uh, you know, uh, up to the history of about 19, you know, 15. Uh, very, very briefly, I'm just setting it up. That's all I'm doing. I don't know, we're not really expecting to look at this history in any great detail. When I last spoken to you about China, uh, I've spoken to you about two or three different things. One was uh, the Opium War, the Second Opium War, which ends around 1860. Uh, right? So that we, had, we had spoken about China in that context. We had also spoken about China and compared it to Japan. And we had looked at those passages from Nehru, where Nehru had contrasted what you might describe as the somewhat different trajectories of modernization uh, in China and Japan. Uh, and before I get to this, uh, so here I've, uh, you know, one trajectory is what I call modernism, uh, which is a movement in art, architecture, music, and so on. But modernism, modernity, and modernization are three different words. Modernization, in some respects, is the easiest to understand, right? Because when we say modernization, so when, for example, technology comes into a country, right? The railways are an illustration of modernization, the instance of modernization. When you speak about various, various tools of production and how those change, we are speaking again of modernization. When we speak about uh, the fact that you know uh, roads that are gravel roads, dirt roads, are now going to be transformed into proper roads. Right? We're speaking about modernization. Right? So you can you can associate that with with certain kinds of technological advances, right? not exclusively necessarily that, but that would be one way to look at modernization. Modernism refers to a sensibility. So we speak of modernism, which is really going to be the subject uh, when I speak about modernism on Wednesday. Uh, you know, I'm speaking about this movement in art, literature, architecture, and so on. And the question is, what kind of sensibility are we really speaking about when we speak about modernism? Right? What are the factors that gave shape to it? But before we turn to that very briefly, modernity. That's the third word that you need to think about. Because of course, this is the 20th century ushers in a kind of modernity. And you might say that modernization is part of modernity, but modernity means something much more. Right? Modernity, for example, if, if, if the question that you got was, well, what is it? What, what can we say about modernity? So one of the things that happens under modernity is a certain kind of displacement of notions of time and space with which we have lived. All right, The transformation of notions of time and space are very critical to an understanding of modernity. The idea of the self, the idea of the subject, the idea of subjectivity, 
The idea that you are the agent. You are not simply someone upon whom things are being enacted. Right? All of this is going to be important to understand the advent of modernity. Right? So we've got modernization, we've got modernity, and then we have modernism. Right? And as I said to you, modernism is a movement in the arts and all of that. Right? What gives shape to it? What gives, what gives shape to it is a number of different things, such as the rapid growth of cities. The fact that the notion of an industrial society has now become predominant, certainly in places in Western Europe. And when we speak about modernism, we're really speaking about the United States. We're speaking about Europe. To some extent, some strands of modernism were going to be prevalent in Asia, too. But but largely what we're really speaking about is certain kinds of developments emanating from Western Europe. The, rejectment, re the rejection of enlightenment thinking, the rejection of religious belief. Now you can see why it's different from modernization. Right? Modernization doesn't indicate things about a sensibility in the same way. What is a place of religious belief for artists such as Picasso? for example, and you'd have to say, well, very good, if any. Or the kind of artists who become associated with modernism more generally. You don't really see much of, much of what you might call either enlightenment thinking or religious belief. Ezra Pound, one of the great modernist poets in 1934, he had a motto, a slogan, and the slogan was very simple in three words, make it new, right? Now, this, this could be interpreted as a kind of a fetishization of the new. You can interpret it that, but it is also a rejection of the past as in some ways obsolete. So for example, in the case of the novel, what modernism leads to is the stream of consciousness kind of novel. Now, some of you might have read Virginia Woolf. Right? Virginia Woolf would be an illustration of that kind of stream of consciousness novel that we're speaking about. So this is a major movement. and. Uh, uh, I just want to briefly alert you to the role of Vienna. Ro role of Vienna in all of this, because Vienna was, uh, when I say turn of the century, I'm talking about, of course, 1900, roughly. There's a beautiful book by Shorsky, S-C-H-O-R-S-K-E, Karl Shorsky. It's called Fin de Siegle Vienna. It's basically a study of what was happening in Vienna circa 1900. Uh, and incidentally, the great institution where all of these people were going to congregate. And you know, the artists, the philosophers, the musicians, many of them knew each other, right? What was that great institution? You can still see it, uh, remnants of it certainly, the coffee house, the Vienna coffee house. This is where they would gather, right? So this is another way of understanding, of course, that public sphere that I mean alerting you to. Uh, and Vienna was, of course, the heart of what you might call the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There were a great many people there uh, belonging to different, remember, one empire, many nationalities, many nations formula, right, that I have spoken to you about, right? So you've got Austro-Germans, you've got Hungarians, you've got Czechs, Slovenians, Ruthenians, Serbians, Croatians, Bosnians, right? This is just a small cross-section of all the people who had converged around Vienna. And why Vienna in particular, what's interesting, recall, where does Eastern Europe begin? I had asked you this question, right? When we, very often, geography books will say Western Europe, Eastern Europe. So what is Eastern Europe? Right? And I've given you a political argument. I've given you a political argument where I said that Eastern Europe is in fact actually that part of Europe which is deliberately, if I may put it this way, underdeveloped. This was, this was the place that was colonized first in the European imagination. Uh, the Slavs were, were represented as being as less than human by the great Enlightenment figures. Now Vienna, Austria, more generally, Vienna sits at the crossroads of Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Europe. Right? So, it, so this, it, is that, it is that hybrid nature of uh, hybrid may not be quite the word, because we don't know that there were hybridity. Rather, it is, it is a place which is a 
crossroads, a crossroads for many different kinds of people, a kind of a diversity which makes possible immense cultural and intellectual productivity. You know? All right? So uh, think about this. And this is the milieu out of which Sigmund Freud arose. Right? Freud is born in Vienna, and he is going to spend a great many years there. He's, he's, he's not going to die there. Just shortly, shortly before his death, he is going to land up in London. Uh, he's Jewish. Uh, many of these figures were Jewish, not all of them, but many of these figures were Jewish. Uh, and Vienna is, in fact, in that way, the birthplace of psychoanalysis, modernist architecture, uh, and such things as well for the music. Uh, it is also the birthplace, also the birthplace of political anti-Semitism. Someone like Hitler comes out of that milieu out of Vienna. It is in Vienna that Hitler is going to learn the vocabulary, the rhetoric of anti-Semitism. That's where he's going to really imbibe it. All right? So that's, those are, those last two fronts have opened up and have started talking about Freud. But uh, just a couple of minutes. That's it. A couple of minutes on China, just so I can set it up for you. And then we're going to look, as I said on Wednesday, at Mao particularly. Uh, and the report on the condition of the peasantry in Hunan and Freud's uh, civilization and his discontent. So you have what is called the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion is uh, uh, enormously complicated. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it starts in 1850, goes up to 18, you know, 60, 1864, okay? Um, and it's led by this uh, uh, man. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the pronunciation. I think it's Hong Shu Guan. Uh, who was born in Guangzhou, um, uh, which is on China's southeast coast. He, he, takes, he takes the civil services exam uh, four times and fails it four times, by the way. Um, comes in contact with Protestant missionaries in 1836. He believed himself to be, by the way, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. All right? Uh, and, and this is going to lead to some uh, sort of bizarre interpretations of Christianity on his part. The, the gist of the matter is that he wants to basically deliver China from what he calls uh, evil, all right? Uh, so he, so his followers are going to, uh, he's going to amass a huge number of followers. Uh, this rebellion goes on from 1850 to uh, 1864. His preaching is directed largely against the Qing dynasty. Uh, and in areas that came under his control, the examination system is abolished. Uh, it's an attack on the Confucian order. That's how you might want to think about it. So that's what I mean by the slow slow erosion of the Confucian uh, order. Um, but eventually, and he establishes his capital in Nanjing, also sometimes referred to as Nanjing. So 1864 is when he's, he's going to die. All right? Uh, now, I think we're going to probably have to stop there. Uh, and we're going to pick it up from there very quickly, just five or 10 minutes to take you up to China in 19.